In the program which follows, Sanel Gavaska talks about the greatness of some of his leading contemporaries. What are their uniqueness? What sets them apart from others? Important facts about their careers. These are the things Gavaska will discuss. He will also demonstrate and analyze the one shot of each player, which in Gavaska's view are the player's most notable shot. You will see these players in actual test matches as Gavaska discusses them. So I hope you will sit back and enjoy this program because you're about to see a fascinating montage of some of the great batsmen of the 70s and 80s. This is the Feroz Kotla cricket ground in Delhi the stage on which many great innings have unfolded. On this very pitch where I'm standing now, history has been written and rewritten. The greatest of them have come here and performed their parts in the endless drama of cricket. They are gone now. The crowds have come and cheered. They too have gone. What lingers on is the memory of those events. Who can forget Vivian Richards' first test century? A colossal 192 not out that was put together right here a decade ago. In 1960, Mustaq Mahmud, that great stalwart of Pakistani cricket, got his first 100 against India here on this ground at the tender age of 19. The following year, Vijay Manjreka's onslaught on English bowlers with an unbeaten 189, or Tiger Pathodi's unbeaten double century a few years later, also against England. It was here in 1981 that Geoffrey Boycott scored his 105 and surpassed Sir Gary Sobers' record to become the highest scorer in Test cricket. And Welcome back to the real world. Leechif, rain, fog, December. The big question is, would Parkhead be playing today? The answer, of course they would. We're going to make a little film now, and in this film we're going to discuss not how this club ought to play cricket, but how it does play cricket. In this De La Salle College of Cricket, where most of us think we're teachers, but where in actual fact, most of us, all but a few of us, are still students. And may I say, at the risk of offending anyone present, then a resemblance to players, living or dead, is entirely intentional. So, just have a quick drink. And now for the chat, let's play some cricket. Well, there's no doubt the business of cricket is batting. And the business of batting is to stay in. So, how do you deal with that deadly ball, that good leg ball on middle stump or on the stumps generally in fact. This is how Dave Hardman tends to do with that ball. Now, what about Barry Roberts? Barry favours what we describe as the full frontal. Doesn't always work that one. Mark Simpson's got a different technique. We call this the flat foot lunge. Matthew Green's more disastrous technique is the kamikaze. Across some pretty quick bowling. Now when Tom Mayer gets the opportunity to get into the early part of the innings, he's developed a pretty individual way of dealing with quick bowling, which involves as little footwork as possible. It's famous now throughout the leagues, it's called the Norman Arch. It goes something like this. Now, Matt Simerson almost never gets an opportunity to get into the early part of the innings, but sometimes, as I said, in the later part, you get some quick bowling too. Now, Matt's developed Tom's arch technique to uh, the nth degree, and he's a bit suspicious of the shorter ball, you know, he's a bit worried about his vitals, so he's developed what we call the Gothic arch, which involves a little more footwork. Um, right, 
Chris Morton, on the other hand, who is a mass of courage and values his wicket more than his vitals or anything else really, has developed what we describe as the perpendicular, which involves, again, quite a lot of footwork and quite a lot of physical discomfort. OK then, well we've looked a bit at defensive play there, not much time to do much more. Of course batting's about scoring runs, so you can't let the bowler dominate you. And the best way to get after a bowler is to drive him. Now, the orthodox way to play a drive, pitched on middle or middle and off, is to play either straight back or through the offside. Now John Flarty, one of our upcoming, now probably established players, has got a good way of frustrating the bowler and the fielders, he plays it a bit like this. Come on then. Okay, that was John. I don't suppose I'd be too flattered about that, but well, that's what we've often seen, John. One of our most senior players, a fellow we don't see so much of these days, he won't let the body get on top of him, and he favours the same kind of stroke, but with even more extravagance involved. I'm talking about Keith Hartley, and he plays a stroke a bit like this. Come on. Well, that was Uncle Keith. Two of our young lions. Well, they, they don't usually bother to play themselves in quite as much as one or two of us. Dave Harden, for example. I'm talking, of course, about Nick Hopkins and Pete Methley. Now, they, their watchword is attack from the word go. And the way they play this stroke, and it can be against a really first-class ball right on the stumps, is something like this. Still, of course, at the, until the moment of delivery, then left foot, or in Nick Hopkins' case, of course, right foot, down the pitch to leg, bat raised high, huge downswing, follow through rather like a golf shot, and a high follow through, and the result is invariably something pretty spectacular, I can tell you. Well, I suppose we've been talking predominantly up to now about quick medium bowling, if we've talked about bowling at all. Of course, you sometimes come across some uh, spinners, purported spinners. And if it's any good, it can peg you down. Now, one of our players who won't be pegged down is John Hartley, pretty aggressive guy. And he is always ready to leap out of his crease and take that spinner on. And this is the way he does it. And watch the follow through as well. Oh, he's bad! OK, we've talked to him about shot making. You've seen some interesting shots. Well, I hope you haven't, anyway. We're going to talk now about something which is essential to good batting, and that's calling and running. And I'm telling you, I'm the guy to tell you about that, as I'm sure you'll all agree. Now, the kind of situation you want to avoid is one of misunderstanding, and it's one that occasionally arises, but rarely when I'm playing. This kind of situation I want you all to bear in mind is what I'm going to demonstrate now, OK? Yes! No! Yes! No! Yes! yes. No! Oh, he's there! Oh, bollocks! Sorry. Sorry. OK, we've talked about batting. We've talked enough about batting. Now, I've said batting's a business of cricket. It's true to some degree, of course, but it's bowlers who win matches. And bowlers, particularly of the fast seam variety, they need a good run-up, a good smooth, even run-up. Now, the fellow that inspired me most in this field, and he's not playing anymore these days, which is very sad, is Graham Hutton. This is the way Graham used to come up to the stomach. Well, a good run-up is important for a seamer, as you've just seen. It's equally important for a spinner, surprisingly enough. 
You may have noticed that I bowled left-handed, was great in actual fact he's a right-hander. But of course my great hero is a left-handed spinner. And uh, he's got a great run-up. And it's uh, it's an inspiration. And I'll demonstrate the effect he's had on me, because this is how he does it. You mind standing back up, Fire? Well, one man who's a regular player has got a style all of his own, and it works in both in maintaining his balance and in intimidating the batsman. And you'll see why when I demonstrate in slow motion with the aid of the umpire the Zieg Heil or goose step technique. One of our most famous bowlers has a unique way of intimidating the batsman, but more often than not, it intimidates the umpire, as this demonstration will clearly show. <laughs> OK, well, it's raining pretty hard now, but Parker want to keep batting, so we'll talk about fielding a bit. Probably in the early part of the innings, Apart from the wicketkeeper, one of the most important fielders is the slip fielder, because that's when you get most of the snakes. So, uh, the slip fielder's really got to be on his metal, and he's got to watch every ball. In fact, watching the ball is the most important thing he can be doing. And this is what I've got really in mind. Yours! The slip fielder, as we've seen, gets in the action. Probably the most dramatic part in the field though is that catch, that steepler, that one which loses you the game or wins it you. One of my great inspirations over the years before he retired was Mr. Hugh O'Grady who was just unique in this respect. Being alert on the square at any part of the game can always save those quick singles which the batsman is always eager to take and can get you many a run out. When Tom was captain, he never let the birds of captaincy distract him from his alertness and his attention to what was going on in the game. Tom, what is it? Oof! The most maligned person on the field at any one time in the game is the umpire. Just because he's not playing, he doesn't really get much regard. But he's got a lot of things to learn and things to bear in mind when playing. He's got to learn all those damn signals. Well, one or two of the ones I saw this year demonstrated what a task he's got. What about uh, four? How many of you know that one? And six. Uh, can you guess this one? Perhaps possibly the most difficult one of all to learn and remember. Is it Benham? It's worse than that. He's dead, Jim. With all these awesome technical responsibilities, sometimes the umpire is merely treated as a beast of birth. Here, umpire, can you do you know any sweater? <laughs> I can take my sweater, please. Certainly, yeah. Well, Here's some, uh, Yeah, sure. Okay. Some nice yeah. You bet, yeah. Can you, can you 
scary box. It's the most awesome responsibility of the umpire is the decision whether to give somebody out or not. And sometimes he can find himself under some quite a new pressure. How is that? Not a... Uh... How is that? Not a... Uh... What? Just because it's the end of the season, the close season, doesn't mean you can't get any practice in. Because there's indoor practice as well, you know. There's catching. Cheers. There's throwing. There you go, Badger. There's uh, labatting. And of course, at the end of the season, and at the end of tonight, there's always awards. Cheers. <laughs> 